Thank you all for being here. It's my great pleasure to have a chance now to have a chat with both Brian and Tim. One of the interesting things about both of you as we were preparing for tonight was recognizing that you've both been doing the work that you've been doing for roughly the same amount of time. So Tim and Kathy started Redeemer 27 years ago, and Brian started the Equal Justice Initiative 27 years ago. So there's a poetic justice in that, as it were. Um, but, but in the course of the work that both of you have done, you've faced a lot of disappointments, discouragements, failure. You talk in the book even about having bomb threats. Um, and so as you've shared with us tonight the importance of hope, I, I wanted to ask both of you to talk about how have you sustained hope in the face of the work that you've done over the last 25 plus years? What has sustained you made, and kept you hopeful in the midst of, of discouragement and setbacks? So. Who first? After you, Brian. <laughs> well, you know, I, I mean, I've been really fortunate. We've seen tremendous change. Uh, while things have been at times very difficult, um, you know, we've had a lot of success. We've now, uh, you know, won the release of 125 death row prisoners. Uh, we've, we've had these successes at the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, I think there has been progress. Uh, I mean, that uh, we're now at EJI uh, building a national memorial to victims of lynching, that we're now creating a museum that's designed to change this narrative, that we're producing materials that are designed to deal with it. It's something way beyond whatever I expected we could do. And I think for me, what would be really uh, dispiriting, what would make me feel hopeless is to see the things that I see, know the things that I know, and do nothing. Mm -hmm. So for me, not doing what we do uh, would be the thing that would demoralize me. Uh, the second thing is that I know I stand on the shoulders of a lot of people. My office is in Montgomery, Alabama, and every now and then when we have a difficult day, I'll go into our little conference room and I'll look out the window and I'll think about the people who were fighting this fight before me and it will humble me. Because as difficult as my days, we have had death threats, we have had bomb threats, we've had a lot of pushback and resistance, but I've never had to say, my head is bloody but not bowed, like the people who were fighting before me. And it gives me some perspective to know that I'm actually quite fortunate, quite privileged, quite supported to do the things that I believe God has called me to do, and that means you have no choice but to keep doing them. I, I think as a minister, I've actually got, a, um, I've got an advantage because uh, I, uh, what I want to see happen is in some ways more, um, I've got a broader range of things. I am definitely looking for, uh, I would love to see uh, the needle moved when it comes to justice uh, as a minister, I've actually, in some ways, I'm here to uh, change people's lives with the gospel, send them out, and uh, to change the world. It's my job, in a sense, to form them so they can be world changers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and therefore, in some ways, I don't have quite the same um, pressure to say, well, what exactly do you expect? Well, I don't know. I, I expect God to do things through what I'm doing, but I'm not quite sure what they are. Um, and the other advantage I have, besides the fact that I don't have any real goals. Um, <laughs> there is a, there's a sense in which that's true. I mean, there is a sense in which I, I'm, you know, we're casting our gospel bread upon the waters to see what happens. But the other thing is, um, uh, and this is no different for me than Brian or anybody with faith, is that I actually do know in the end the right wins. The good, the right, justice wins, justice triumphs. And so, I don't know what percentage of that progress I'll see in my lifetime, but I don't have to worry that much about it. I don't, so whenever things really, really look bleak, you say, but in the end, what I'm doing is moving in a direction that someday, and I, you know, a Christian says, and I will see it. Yes. Mine eyes will see. Yes. You know, the Redeemer will stand on the earth and things will be put right. Yeah. So obviously that's the ultimate hope that we can always draw on as people of faith. Yeah. Let me ask you a question, Tim, directly about Redeemer specifically. Um, Brian has talked a lot about tonight about the systemic issues in our justice system and how they disproportionately affect black and brown people. Yes. Yet, um, if we think about the makeup of Redeemer, it's largely a church of white and Asian people. So just wondering um, for folks who, who might be in the audience thinking and asking, why should I care about these particular issues around justice? 
what would you say to them? Well, the, the, the Bible, I, uh, I didn't get there tonight because there was uh, there's too much to say. The Bible believes in corporate sin, corporate responsibility. Uh, in Daniel chapter 9, uh, let me talk about white people for a minute. I'll leave, I'll, leave, I'll leave the Asians aside for a second here. But no, don't, don't get your hopes up. Um, the, uh, uh, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel is confessing the sins of his forefathers, repenting for them. Um, he, um, he doesn't, uh, and you know, the average American says, that's crazy, he, he, he didn't do those things. Uh, he I evidently was maybe born and raised in exile, and he wasn't part of the generation of people who sinned against God and, and led to the exile. He, he confesses the sin. Uh, there are other places in the Bible where uh, a, a family or a tribe is punished for one person's sin, like in Joshua chapter 7. And it's because actually I think God knows, and actually most of the rest of the world knows what Americans don't, and that is what you are for good and ill, to a great degree, uh, is the product of your community. So, for example, if you are bad, uh, your community does bear some responsibility for that because the community was the kind of place where you could become that. And, of course, now that, and I think I shared this with Brian in the back, uh, back uh, a friend of mine recently was, uh, who's a pastor was talking to a Norwegian uh, man who had just moved into his, to his community and went to his church. And at one point he heard... Uh, the pastor talking about the fact that uh, uh, we, were, we were all complicit in creating this narrative that uh, uh, black people are dangerous, etc., and so we're complicit in this. Afterwards, the, white, the, the, the Norwegian came up and said, no, 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 that's, I'm Norwegian. <laughs> no, I had nothing to do with it. And, and, <laughs> my, uh, and my pastor friend said, uh, studies have shown have pretty much proven that if you have white skin, it's worth a million dollars over a lifetime over somebody who doesn't have white skin. And that's because of historical forces that uh, have come about. And at this point, you know, you, you could go at it several ways. One, as I mentioned, if you have that asset of white skin right now, historical asset, then you actually have to say, I, I didn't deserve this. And also, I'm, to some degree, I'm the product of uh, I'm standing on the shoulders of other people who got that through injustice. So uh, the Bible actually says, yes, you do, you do, you are um, involved in injustice, and even if you didn't actually do it, therefore you have a responsibility, not just to say, well, you know, maybe if I get around to it, maybe we could do something about the poor people out there. No, you're, you're part of the problem. If you do actually let your, your understanding of responsibility be shaped by the Bible instead of American individualism, um, Asians, I think I would say the same thing, in a way I would say the Norwegians. Uh, the fact is that Asians and Latinos and African Americans, because of the background, because of the, the history difference, you actually are coming in at different levels. It's very clear, for example, uh, Bill Stuntz in his book on um, American criminal justice says, 10% of black people use drugs, 9% of white people use drugs, 8% of Latinos use drugs. Black people are nine times more, like 900% more likely to be convicted for crime. Uh, white people are at the bottom and, and Latinos are in the middle. Now, how did that happen? In other words, it has nothing to do with the actual drug use. The fact is that black people are incarcerated and convicted at that level, Latinos in the middle, and white people the least, actually shows that for various reasons you come in as a black, Latino, and white person at different levels of, uh, you could say, privilege or different levels of disadvantage, as it were. And I think white people have to realize we have the least, and Asians actually do have less privilege than white people do, and Latinos less, and so on. Now, this is, my, to some degree, I, the trouble with me speaking as a minister is everybody thinks, that, well, if you're, as Tim Keller said, this must be in the Bible somewhere. Some of what I'm saying <laughs> is in the Bible, and some of it is my opinion. You just need to know that. But I think what, what I'm trying to say is that everybody who's here needs to recognize uh, a, that you're part of a history, you're part of, that you can't escape the history, you can't just say, I wasn't part of that. So it's not just that Christians have these great resources to do justice and this great motivation and grace, but we have an obligation.
we have an absolute obligation. We can't just say, well, that's their problem. I think, though, that, that Brian, you'd probably also say that, that our humanity is damaged when the humanity of others suffer, and that's also biblical, yes. right? So Dr. King, you know, obviously talks about the fact that we're hurting ourselves. Yeah. I, I guess I would, listen, the only, I'd say that too. I absolutely agree with it. I always hate the, the idea that this is, I don't like appealing to self-interest. I actually do feel like a lot of my secular friends, I even saw Frank Bruni in a, you know, a, 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 um, a New York Times editorial just last week said, um, when we try to help the poor, we try to help disadvantaged because we're really, we're really doing this for ourselves because we need this. This will, this will make a better society for all of us. And I, yes, of course that's true. Of course it's true. But I actually don't like the idea. It, my idea is that if, if I'm going to do justice, I'm going to lose something. If, I, if, if I'm helping the downtrodden, the only way to really help them is I have to give up something or they're not coming up. And I think there's, there's, a, there's a kind of tendency for people to, to say it's win-win. If we help them, then we're making it better for everybody. Well, yes, of course we are. But actually, unless you're willing to give something up, which Christians should be willing to do, you're not really helping them. It'll be a cosmetic. So I'm a little, that's the reason why I totally believe what Dr. King said is you're, you're, helping, you're helping all of humanity when you help the poor. But... Uh, you are going to lose some things, and I, we, should, we should be willing to do that. And I think some of that, some of that has to do with, uh, you know, what, what we're burdened by. You know, I, I don't think anybody in this room, I don't think many, many people who have actually endorsed the policies that have created the way we punish children in this country would have felt differently than I did when I left that jail cell after that child had admitted the things that he admitted to me. I think it creates a burden for any human being to see that kind of suffering. And then, then we want to do something uh, to help that child because it becomes a burden on us. And that's the, that for me is, right. is the, the power of getting proximate. We are burdened. We take on the burdens of the poor. We take on the burdens of those who are incarcerated. We take on the burdens of the afflicted. And when we take those burdens on, we want to lift their chains off and lift our chains off too. Our humanity is connected to their humanity. And, it's, and, and for me, it's it's not even self-interest, it's what it means to be fully human. If I see you suffering, I cannot be a full human being. I need it for me to respond to your suffering. And uh, I think if God shapes us the kind of hearts and minds and spirits that we become responsive and sensitive uh, to the things around us, then, uh, then that who we are and what, who they are becomes a much more amorphous, a much less defined uh, understanding. Of course, being a pastor, I like guilt better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, no. think, I think there's something, I mean, I do think there's really, I mean, I, I think one of the challenges that we have collectively as a society is that in this country, we do victory great, we do success great, we do power great, we do not do shame very well, we do not do guilt very well. We don't own up to our mistakes. No. And the absence of shame is what makes us vulnerable to discrimination and bigotry and abuse of power. Right. I actually think if you see two people who've loved each other for 50 years, if you ask them what the secret is, they've learned how to say I'm right. sorry to one another. Yeah. They've learned how to navigate those problems. And we haven't done that collectively as a society. So no. I actually think there's a role for yeah. and guilt and shame. And Christians believe that on the far side of repentance is more grace. Yes, absolutely. So that's the reason why, even though I made a joke about it, I like the guilt part too, I do think we should be calling yes. the nation and one another to repentance. Absolutely. Not because we're going to hate ourselves for this or our lives, it means we're going to have more grace. Absolutely, so. absolutely. So how do we do that? I mean, let's talk specifically about truth and reconciliation. You, you mentioned Rwanda, you mentioned South Africa, countries that had overt acts and, and ceremonies and you know, occasions to, to come and to repent and to confess. And so what would that look like for us in the United States? And, and what's the role of the church in that process specifically? Well, I, I'd love to see the church be a leader in this effort. I mean, our landscape is littered with the iconography of a false history. Uh, kind of a narrative uh, rooted in anger and fear and ignorance. And I think we need to change that iconography. Uh, we've started this marker project where we're putting up, when, if you'd come to Montgomery three years ago, you'd find a city with 59 markers and monuments to the, to the Confederacy uh, with all of this kind of stuff and not a word about slavery. And uh, we did the research and began uh, to recognize that Montgomery was one of the most uh, active slave trading cities in America. And we just wanted to acknowledge it. And we went to the Alabama Historic Commission and said, we want to put up this marker about slavery. They said, no, 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 that would be too controversial. 
and we had to navigate this discourse. And we started putting up these markers, and, and now we've got this project to put up markers at lynching sites. We're inviting people to join us. Uh, we go to lynching sites, we do this community remembrance where we go to a site and we pray and we reflect and we fill a jar with the name of the victim with soil and we make an exhibit out of it. Uh, we have this project to kind of educate people through our calendars, which I invite everybody here uh, to get. Uh, you just go to our website at eji.org and use these tools as a way of talking about this education. I actually think we do need to talk about uh, renaming uh, the, and, and uh, dealing with this kind of this landscape that is littered with all of this stuff. We believe in memorials in this country. It didn't take 15 years to get a 9-11 memorial in this city. Uh, we just haven't done it for the things that ex express victimization in other spaces. And so I think that's part of it. But I think the other part of it is just acknowledging that we have this problem. You know, if you're, and I, and I say this, you know, I, I told that story about being in court, but I go so many places where I feel like I have to take on the responsibility of someone to comfort the people around me because my very present has created anxiety and I hate that. I'm a really, really nonviolent person. It would take a lot. I don't think I could be a problem in most situations. And yet, you, and that burden, that presumption of danger, it's exhausting. So I want to lift that burden. And that means we have to talk about these problems. We have to acknowledge these problems. We have to have a heart to sit through some things that are difficult and challenging. Okay, and then you also have talked a lot about the power of proximity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just going to switch now and begin to, to field some of the questions that are coming in. Um, and you talked about, uh, you, you know, schools and, and being in neighborhoods. So one of the questions coming in has to do with um, gentrification and how, you know, sort of the tension that exists when we try to get proximate. That might not be the motive why we're moving into that neighborhood. But then the, the complex dynamics that then develop in terms of displacement. Mm. And so what... what how do, you, how, how do we navigate that as people of faith? Yeah, I don't really think of gentrification as proximity because what happens is, um, in, in, in part because what people do is they come into a space and they say, we're going to make this space like the last space we inhabited. So we want all the homeless people taken away. We want all the drug addicts taken away. We want all of this. We, they just change spaces uh, that further isolate people who are just closer physically. And it actually deepens that sense of divide. Uh, you know, for me, uh, you don't get anything uh, ostensibly out of your choice to get proximate. When you go into a place uh, empty-handed sometimes and just are there, what you're going to get is not some big financial reward. It's not going to be a nice new house. It's not going to be closer access to your job. It's not going to be any of those things. It's going to be actually some burdens that you pick up because you see things that you haven't seen. And for me, that's what that's about. Uh, and I do think that we have to be responsible in the choices that we make about those kinds of questions, about what is the consequence of this, what is the consequence of that. And I think if we're thoughtful about that, we make different decisions about where we live and how we live. But to be proximate, it, it's costly, right? I mean, both of you have talked about that. You ha we have to give something up to be close to people. Um, and, and so talk a little bit more about how do, how do we... How to, how to make different decisions and how to, how to count the cost in a way that gets ourselves out of the issue and makes ourselves part of the solution. How do we do that? Well, I'll, I'll start. I mean, at, 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 there are literally, uh, right now, there really are lots and lots of um, ministries and programs that could get you uh, proximate if you don't just give money, mm -hmm. but you get involved. Now, here, an example. I just... Uh, I was just recently talking to somebody who, uh, a church in the Charlotte, evidently in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, uh, got involved with a couple other community organizations. They identified in a very poor public, a public school in a very poor neighborhood, uh, 10 at-risk kids that they uh, were going to try to get them to, to complete high school. They were definitely, they had all the marks of, of kids that wouldn't finish high school. Um, and I, I think... By the way, I think I saw a bill in Bill Stunts, 60% of all black males that don't finish high school go to jail yeah. or something like that. Like crazy. Yeah. Anyway, um, and so what, uh, he, they were, this church was part of a, um, uh, a series of uh, organizations that, in the community. They were actually basically adopting these 10 kids. And they, it, this was, uh, it was a, a, a ministry, basically, that knew how to do it. But what they did was they didn't ask much for money, but they, 
they, they identify the needs of the kids. So for example, there was a dentist in, the, um, uh, in this church. They were looking for a dentist because the kids get no dental care at all. And it actually, is, I mean, you would think, oh, of all the things, well, they had a whole lot of things that the kids need. One of them was free dental care. So this uh, Christian dentist in this uh, school starts to basically give free dental care to the kids. So he gets to know them, gets to know the families. And after a while, he's outraged. He says, how, what, what, how did this happen? I mean, here's a guy who lived like just four miles away. Mm-hmm. And he began to get a look at, at, at the, whole, the life of these, these kids. And began to say, here we are in America. Wait a minute, I didn't know. It's being proximate. Yes. He actually started getting more involved in, you might say, justice issues, housing yeah. issues, yeah. all sorts of other things, just because he was, he was recruited to do free medical care for these 10 kids. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. See, that, that's a perfect example. Yes. And there's zillions of yes. those kinds of yes. examples. Because yes. I think that's the important part of it. This, this becomes a portal to a whole new way of thinking about issues that we've been thinking about in a different way. So if you spend time in these zip codes where we know that 80% of the kids are likely to end up in jails and prisons, you quickly realize that this is epidemic of trauma. You've got children born into violent families, living in violent neighborhoods, going to violent schools, and they show up to school at four and five with trauma disorders, just like returning vets. And if you know anything about treating trauma, you know that the solution is to try to make that child, that person, feel safe. And we're doing the opposite in our schools. We're actually threatening them. As soon as they yeah. get to school, we say, you make this mistake and we're going to suspend you. We make this f- mistake and we're going to expel you. We put metal detectors. We have principals who sound like wardens and teachers who sound like correctional officers. And if you understand that, you actually begin to advocate for different policies. I actually think that the Department of Education should be including suspension rates and expulsion rates when they judge schools. It should not just be on what kind of scores you get on performance tests. Because if we change that, if we make schools responsible for the kids who are most vulnerable and most at risk, they're going to have radically different programs. If you can't just suspend them and expel them, if you understand the impact of mandatory sentencing, those, are, those, those laws, they're anti-mercy laws. They are. They say, we don't care. We're unwilling to show. We don't want to know the story. We don't know what the circumstances. But when you see it playing out in the lives of people, then you become radical about some of these issues. And it changes your worldview. And that really is the power of that dynamic. So let me just ask this as a follow-up then. Um, Several questions have come in about being in community and serving alongside people who are very different from us. How do we hold our weaknesses and power in tension to serve as equals? You know, I think, for me at least, uh, I mean, I've always, uh, we've been really fortunate to have a very diverse staff at the Equal Justice Initiative. And, you know, what I say to to our folks is that I need you to be committed, I need you to be um, willing to work hard, and I need you to commit to being client-centered. That is, if we're going to serve, then we have to think about the things that we need to do that best help the people we are trying to serve. And I will tell them, It may not be great for you if you have some other agenda. It may not be great for you, but that's the commitment its clients serve. I talked to another head of an NGO, and what she says is, if I ever hear anybody on my staff use the word sacrifice, that's when they're going to be fired immediately. Because they don't want that consciousness. Because if you come into it that way, you can't reconcile that tension between power and weakness, right? I mean, I've been doing this work a really long time, you know, uh, and I've never, there's never been a day where I felt like uh, I had, had done something sacrificial. I feel really privileged to do what I do. I feel really empowered to do what I do. I feel like it's the greatest gift God could give me to let me see redemption in places that other people see only condemnation, to see love in places where people only can see hate. For me, that is a great privilege. And I think when you approach it in that way, your weaknesses become your strength. Your power becomes a tool for serving others. And there, that tension is really mediated by that common commitment. So here's a a big question for Brian. What's your dream of truth and reconciliation? Can you paint a picture of that for us? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, we'd look, uh, the landscape of this country would look very different. Um, I think uh, we'd actually uh, begin thinking about what it would take to repair. So I'm going to just say something a little kind of edgy. Uh, I actually think... Uh, that we need to do some reparational work in this country. Um, Because you cannot 
have decades and centuries of damage and not be concerned about the repair. My orientation around reparations is a little different though. I, I, I mean, if I just fell over and knocked you down and injured you, I could not go on the rest of the weekend without making sure you know I did not mean to hurt you. And I'd wanna know how you're doing, I'd wanna call on you because I need that to feel like a healthy, decent human being. And that's the kind of consciousness that I wanna cultivate in this country. Knowing that we are traumatizing children, knowing we have abused people. Know, you know, when we have people who are wrongly convicted, and this client of mine spent 30 years on death row for a crime he did not commit. He was locked in a five by seven cell for 30 years in solitary confinement. He watched 55 people go past him to be executed. And when we won his release, no one in the state of Alabama felt the need to say, I'm sorry. They have not paid him a penny. And that is rooted in this idea that we have that we don't owe anybody anything for their suffering, their injustice. And I think that's what my dream looks like, is that we would be motivated to change our relationship to those who have been injured and harmed. You know, I don't know why we didn't say in the 1960s after denying black people the right to vote for decades, not only do we need the Voting Rights Act, but we need to create a path to voting for black people that is reparational. I think we should have said, you know, after 1965, Black people can go to any voting poll, polling place in America and cast their vote. I don't know why we didn't say, oh, you know what, on voting day, we're gonna actually send people to your house and get your vote. <laughs> I think we could have even said, you know, in 19, after 1965, you know, black people would deny the right to vote in Alabama. You know what, you get to vote twice on election day. <laughs> <clears throat> it would be, but the idea is, is that we have to do something to repair the distrust that we have created. I don't know, these schools that didn't allow students of color to attend, why not say, oh, if you're a person of African descent whose relatives and families were denied admission, you have to pay half of what everybody else has to pay. And not be bitter about it, not be cynical about it. And then what you find is that you actually see yourself engaged in acts of recovery. You go to Germany, the Germans don't have to do these things, but they don't want to be judged by the Holocaust. They don't want to be stuck in the Holocaust, which means they can't deny it. They have to talk about it. They have to create a new relationship to it. And that's my dream for this country, is that we begin talking about and creating a new relationship to our history of enslavement and segregation and terrorism. Yeah, it's a good word. A good word. And so the follow-up is for Tim. So in the church then, you know, in our church context, what would it look like for people in the church to really pursue truth and reconciliation? and repentance about racial hostility and racial injustice. I mean, what, what could that look like for us? Well, well, actually, Brian, well, I don't know. Brian's already answered that question. I mean, he's, he's given us a lot of different ideas for what could be done, but, you know, I don't think the Equal Justice Initiative could do that all by themselves, That's actually. Right. I mean, it, it, when, a minute ago, oh. right, when a minute, a couple minutes ago, he said, wouldn't the church be uh, the church ought to be leaders in this. And he's given, the, now look, for example, um, I, I listen, we can start right here. Uh, there's a lot of young, um, a lot of young Christians and a lot of new churches in New York, okay? Uh, first of all, you ought to, they, they, we are really, really, from what I can tell, young professionals who are Christians in New York are really very disengaged from their communities, period. Um, I, I know that, in fact, here in Manhattan, generally older Jewish people come to community board meetings because they have a, they're civic-minded, they care, they, uh, for various reasons which I think are rooted in who they are, not only their experience, but basically the Bible, you know, even Christians know two thir three quarters of the, of the Bible's Old Testament, uh, and their understanding of justice, they, they're concerned about justice. They're just out there in the community trying to find out. We are not. We're not. We don't go. In fact, an awful lot of the people that go to our, all these young churches, with young people in, uh, in New York, not just Redeemer, but here in New York City that have been growing in the last 10 or 15 years, a lot of you don't vote at all, do you? I mean, you, don't, you certainly wouldn't even know what a community board is. And you've got to start somewhere, and that is to say public justice means I have to get involved. But we are really, we're busy with, we're busy patting our resumes, busy enjoying, Rede in New York City, it's sort of like a theme park. Where, where we're, we're just, we're consuming all the, the greatness of living here. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to start really down pretty far and say, uh, we are not famous for, for being civic minded. We are not famous at all. Uh, and uh, then secondly, I think it does mean 
that you have to, in the, the, a lot of the churches that have got capital, that is to say they've got power, they've got a lot of people with great degrees, they're moving up the ranks in the, in the you know, the cult cards of power. We really have to, in a non-paternalistic way, we have to listen to our Christian brothers and sisters in the churches in the, in the, the poor areas just of this city and say, honestly, not like, oh, you know, here, we're, here, we're going to help you, but what, do you, what should we be doing? And they may start talking about repentance, and they can show us how, because we're not going to know how. I mean, we have to start awfully, awfully far down. But, but honestly, I don't see how Christ's name will be honored in our culture unless we're famous for being on the forefront of doing the sorts of things that Brian has laid out here that we ought to be doing. Uh, I do really think that the, the level of incarceration, the criminal justice system is not the only one, but it, it is, um, it's just a blight on, the, on our culture and uh, our, our past is a blight. So everything Brian's saying, if the, if the, uh, all these new young churches that we've been starting and planning, if they were famous for this, that's the way to start. But generally, I would actually say we have to get proximate even to our brothers and sisters in the communities of need and not go in saying, oh, we've got so much, we've got a plan for you. No, 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 no. You just, you got to just listen, very, very willing to listen over a period of time. But, you know, the whole idea behind broad-based community organizing, which Saul Alinsky came up with, was you really got to have, uh, you can't rely on business or government for that. You have to have you have to have voluntary associations inside the communities, and generally those are churches. And, and they really have a tremendous amount of, of potential. So, I mean, that's just some ideas. But generally, you, I feel like you already answered the question, just that we have to be willing to say, this should be our agenda too, not just his agenda. As we think about New York City, you, you talked a little bit about, you know, having markers of, of the, the ways that New York City has participated in slavery here. And just wondered if you could share with us about other narratives that you're aware of that have shaped our city in ways that we avoid the truth of the history of even the founding of this, this great city that we love. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I will, um, I, again, I'll just uh, encourage people to, to, to get our calendars because the calendars are actually sort of these daily sort of little history lessons and you'll find lots of stuff in there about uh, New York City. You know, at the end of Reconstruction, um, it was people in the North uh, who basically rejected the idea that emancipation required racial equality. And uh, there was a lot of rhetoric here. Uh, the governor of New York, uh, you know, basically ran for president on a white supremacist uh, platform. And there are buildings and spaces named after that governor. Uh, you know, there was this attitude in, in New York City that we were going to tolerate these refugees from the Deep South, but we certainly weren't going to integrate them. And that presumption of dangerousness and guilt, it follows people. You had stop and frisk policies in the city and we were acting as if it just wasn't that big deal. But if you're a black person and you're stopped 19 times over the course of a summer, it's a huge deal. You don't feel free. And our indifference to that phenomena creates a sort of disconnect. And so all of that becomes part of it. It's, it is the history, but it's also the manifestation of that history in our day-to-day -day lives. There is that implicit bias, that unconscious bias that uh, manifests itself, right? And I think until we become tuned in uh, to the way in which that was shaped and formed, we're not going to be good caretakers of what it's going to take to get out of it. Uh, and so we use our, our calendars, we use our videos, we use some of these tools to just get people to start thinking differently about what it means to be free of that presumption of dangerousness and guilt and how they can change their own way of coping and thinking and behaving. You know, I was on the President's Task Force on Policing and we put out 40 pages of recommendations to change the culture of policing. And we have too many police officers in New York and other cities all across this country that think of themselves as warriors instead of guardians. We don't need warriors on the police department. We need guardians. We need people who see themselves who are there to protect and serve everybody, including people who've committed crimes. And when we begin to create trust and legitimacy, and the church is enforcing that, standing up for that, then we begin to change these big issues that have dominated and oppressed. And uh, I think those opportunities are daily. I think they're everywhere. Uh, and it just takes a commitment to say, okay, I, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to join the Raise the Age campaign here in the, in the state of New York. I'm going to commit to working with organizations like the Fortune Society and the Osborne Society that has these outreach programs to reentry. We're going to start, if we don't already have, prison ministry 
at Redeemer Press. We're going to engage in uh, services to people who are the children of incarcerated parents. It's a long list of things that I think create that dynamic. And, and, and that's the challenge of our time is that it's all around us, but the opportunity is that it doesn't take very much to engage. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. This is going in a slightly different direction, um, but as a church with working professionals, you know, mostly white collar, how should God's truth about justice and mercy inform how people think about their career and calling? And so not everybody can be a defense attorney like you, but um, how, what, what are the ways that you, you can help us think about calling and career vis-a-vis -vis justice and, and the responsibility that Christians have to be involved in justice? Well, I really, I, I'll go back. I, I want to re reiterate what Brian said about... Um, not feeling that the sacri one of the da it <clears throat> the reality is that you do have to make sacrifices to do this. There's no doubt if you, if you care about justice, you won't make as much money because you're going to, at the very least, be spending more time getting proximate. Um, and, uh, it, and it certainly might mean definitely taking jobs in which you know you're doing more social good but you're probably making less money. I mean, there's all sorts of ways in which you will be limiting, you might be limiting your career advancement, you certainly would be, at the very least, you'd be giving away enough money that you wouldn't be able living as well as you should be. So those are sacrifices, but I actually, it's interesting how, how similar um, what uh, Brian said a minute ago was, I, I've heard a minister or two uh, tell me, in fact, one in particular, who said the worst thing in the world would be for a minister to realize just because all of your your classmates are making 10 times more money than you, for you to start to say um, it was a sacrifice but it was worth it would be the worst thing in the world. To, ever, to, to, to give yourself to God, to give yourself to your neighbor, and to say that is really pretty bad because that's actually when there really is a tension between your weakness and your power. But I, I remember one minister once, uh, actually, well, you know David Martin Lloyd-Jones, I always quote him, he was a physician, he was the, he was the assistant to Lord Horder, uh, who was the uh, physician of the, the royal family, and he felt a call to the ministry, and he was Welsh, so he went to a very poor Welsh uh, fishing village, and it made headlines that he went into the ministry, and he, you know, he never made anywhere near the money he would have. And some, at one point, somebody interviewed him because he was working with the poor, and he said, you, you've sacrificed so much, and he said, I sacrificed nothing, I gained everything. The same sense of it's privilege, don't be ridiculous, from one vantage point, it is a sacrifice, and you're going to have to do that. There's another vantage point with, I, what I was trying to say tonight in my talk was, get a grip on the gospel, and then you, it just doesn't, it feels absolutely organic and natural. But there's absolutely no way to get proximate, I love that term, by the way. Um, it's a little, bit of a, a little bit of a riff on John Perkins' relocation, but it's actually probably better in some ways, because relocation does seem, sound like moving there. And as we did say, one of the problems with gentrification, moving closer to the poor isn't really proximate necessarily. In fact, it could be worse than that. So I think there is no doubt that uh, all, the, all the variety of things that we're talking about here will take sacrifice, and yet you actually are going to have to stop thinking of it that way, or it really is going to be paternalistic, and, or, or you won't keep it up because you won't be able to keep it up. It'll, you'll get exhausted. Yeah. And I would just urge people to recognize, I mean, we get locked in into these metrics of what is success, what is achievement. I actually don't think more wealth is the best thing, right? I don't think the people who have the most money are the best people, the happiest people, the most engaged people. I have nothing against people earning money and having livables, but we should reject the idea that you're only moving forward if you're making more and more money, if you're acquiring more and more things. I actually feel rich, 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 and I don't have very much. Uh, but there's another kind of wealth that comes in these relational dynamics, you know, and, you know, uh, you know I, I, I just think that we ought to just be more reflective on what it means to succeed. When I went to Harvard Law School, there was a definition of success, and I saw my classmates, too many of them pulled into this definition. When we started, everybody said, I want to be a poor people lawyer. And then we started redefining what success looked like and what achievement looked like. And there were these metrics and people started going for that because they were so used to achieving and seeking success, they just followed that. But we can redefine what achievement looks like. What Dr. Keller was talking about earlier is that we have to redefine what faith looks like. 
And when we do that redefinition, we begin to realize the most important thing is not how much money we make, not how many people know our names, not where we stand on some hierarchy that somebody else created, but how engaged are we, how alive are we, how faithful are we, how much do we feel grace and mercy, how much do we feel God's love pouring through us. And that's a metric system that can be measured by these things that often the world would have us measured by. Well, that's very much a gospel message, right? Because the, the current, God's currency is one of love. And so what you've just outlined is, is a life of, of love, of giving ourselves away so that others might gain. Yeah. So uh, we're getting near to the end of our time here, but I, I wondered if, if both of you could just speak to the issue of urgency. We, we had a planning meeting last week with some, some folks who work in this field. With, with folks who are coming home having been um, incarcerated. And one, one of the men at that uh, meeting talked about urgency. And then shortly after that meeting, we learned about one of your clients, mm -hmm. Vernon Madison, uh, being scheduled to be executed the following day at 6 p.m. Uh, fortunately, uh, that didn't happen because you were able to, to file some motions to extend his life. But you know, I think for us, it was just a, real, a realization that these are people's lives hanging in the balance and that there really does need to be a, a very acute sense of urgency as we think about these issues. So I wonder if you could just address that for us so that this isn't just an intellectual exercise, but that we really have a sense that we need to, we need to be acting and not just talking. Yeah. Well, I do think that these issues are urgent. I mean, I think there is a despair uh, in, in this country. There, we have 50 million people who live beneath the federal poverty level. Uh, we have this record level of incarceration. We've become the most punitive society in the world. Uh, we are in many ways gasping on the, the, the level of uh, judgment and fear and anger. So I think it, it is an urgent moment. Uh, it, there are opportunities. I think we've gotten a little bit of space now. You've got people from both political parties talking about how there are too many people in jails and prisons. I think there is an opportunity. We just have to fill that space with a strong, vibrant, uh, witness, and I do think the time is now. I mean, on this race stuff, we've been putting this off for decades, for generations. We're still in this room having this conversation because our parents and their parents and their parents were unwilling to do it, and our children and their grandchildren will be having the same conversation until we stand up and take it. So I do think there is something urgent about that, and, and I'll just say this. I mean, for me personally, uh, it's kind of come full circle because I, I, my grandmother was this formative person in my life. And my grandmother was this amazing woman. She was very tough and very strong. She was a very power, she was a power in our house. Uh, when I would see my grandmother as a child, uh, nine or 10, she'd come up to me and she'd give me these hugs and she'd squeeze me so tightly, I could barely breathe. And then she'd see me an hour later and she'd say, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? And if I said no, she would jump on me again. <laughs> and by the time I was 10, she had taught me to say, every time I saw her, I'd say, Mama, I always feel you hugging me. And she had this quality about her, and I'll just tell you one quick story. When I was about nine or ten, she took me down to, my people are from Bowling Green, Virginia. And she said, bring your best suit. And we went down to Virginia, and my grandmother told me to put my suit on in the middle of the week. We walked down this dirt road, and we walked into this field, and there was a shack in the middle of the field. And we started walking through this field, I was very confused by it. And my grandmother said, we're going to walk into this shack, and you're going to hear something. And I said, okay. And we walked into the shack, and I went, it was an empty shack. I didn't hear anything. And I was standing there confused when all of a sudden I saw my grandmother cry. I'd never seen her cry before. And because she was crying, I started crying because I didn't know what was happening. and I didn't hear anything. And we left. And I said, Mama, why were you crying? She said, uh, don't worry about that. And then I said, Mama, I didn't hear anything. She said, yes, you did. And I remember it starting crying again because I thought I had missed something I was supposed to hear. When I was a college freshman at Eastern, I, a sophomore, I did a paper on my grandmother and we just sat for a while and I interviewed her. And at the end of it, she said, do you remember when I, you were young and I took you to that shack? I said, yeah. She said, remember what I told you? I said, yeah, you said something about hearing something. She said, yes, I took you into that shack and you heard something. I didn't know what to say. She said, what I didn't tell you is that shack is the house where my father was born into slavery. It was a slave cabin. And it kind of stuck with me. And now I live in Montgomery. My office is on Commerce Street, and I'm 100 uh, meters from where the, the slave ships would come into Montgomery and where the rail cars would come into Montgomery. Uh, our building is a site of a former slave warehouse. I'm 100 meters from the slave auction site. And sometimes I'll walk down the street. And a couple of years ago, I was walking down there, and I started thinking about my grandmother. And all of a sudden, I felt like I heard something. 
And what I felt like I heard were the sounds of all of these enslaved people that were brought to that community in chains and in anguish who have never been recognized. And then I thought I heard the sounds of all the people who were terrorized and went fleeing across this country. And then I thought I heard the sounds of anguish and humiliation of those who were subjected to segregation. When I go into jails and prisons, I hear the sounds of suffering and now I hear it. And for me, it makes it urgent. I cannot rest while I hear the things I hear and not say something, not do something. And I think that's the power of positioning yourself in these different places. You start to hear the things that motivate you to do the things that have to be done. Now is the time. And I'm excited about that, even though I'm challenged by it. Yeah. Wow, thank you. I want to be edgy. Why should, why should, uh, why should Brian have all the edge? <laughs> I'll say, so, I'll say something edgy. Uh, uh, I'm old enough, I'm old enough to remember. I, I couldn't vote in the 1964 election, but I remember it pretty well, presidential election. Before that election, uh, let's, talk about, let's talk about Christians, Orthodox Christians, s small case O. Okay, Orthodox Christians with a little O. Uh, we're people who believe in the authority of the Bible, but you have to be born again. You're born again through uh, faith in the blood of Christ, not your good works. You believe in, in spreading the good news. Okay, small o. Before uh, 1964, uh, African-American Christians voted both Republican and Democrat. They, they were spread. And white uh, Christians also. They tended, if you were white color, you tended to, to vote uh, Republican. If you were union or working class, you tended to vote um, uh, Democrat. Um, that's all changed radically. And what you actually have is um, Orthodox black Christians, all Democrats largely, and Orthodox white Christians, uh, by and large, Republican. That's, a, that's kind of a scandal right there. And the fact is, because each side kind of feels like the other side, yeah, you're brothers and sisters in Christ, but you're kind of clueless. What are you doing over in that party? Um, we aren't talking. And it's crazy, frankly, we're not talking. Uh, obviously, African-American Christians say, white Christians, you're just obsessed on a lot of stuff. We're just trying to survive. You know, the great migration was, don't shoot me, don't lynch me, let me go to some place where they don't do that. I mean, that's, that's what we were concerned about. And then, you know, uh, white Christians are not, they're, they're, we're obsessing on all sorts of, maybe, we may be right about a lot of cultural issues, but we're obsessing on things. Uh, I feel like this might be a moment, frankly, in which Christians in both parties start to look at each other and say, you know, we're Christians first. Um, we're black and white second, we're Democrat and Republican second, we're Christians first. We need to be listening to each other. And we need to be saying, how do we actually uh, work for justice together, together? And let's find, you, as soon as, if we sit down and start talking, the issues, the justice issues are not going to look like, the first time we talk, the lists aren't going to look at all. There may not even be any overlap on the list. But we have to keep talking. We have to keep praying. And we have to say, why? You know, we're, we're in Christ together. This is nuts. And uh, I actually do think that actually, weirdly enough, might be the first for, for white Christians anyway. Uh, that might really be the first way to get proximate. An another way to get proximate, not just how do we help the poor you know, you know, the poorer people, how do we actually listen to our brothers and sisters, the leaders very often, the brothers and sisters in the African-American church, for example, I'm talking about Christians getting together and saying, where have we been blind? And, and we have to, you know, we have to listen. But I actually think that this might be a moment, I was telling Brian before, there might be a, a moment in which Christians begin to say, you know, we're Christians first, we need to be working together for justice. And I do think, especially frankly under under the age of 40, uh, Christians of all races are much more willing to sit and talk to each other, I think, than the, than the ones over 40, and I'm way over 40. But I, that's, my, that's my edgy thing to say right now. I think, I think we gotta, I, re, I think that scandal has, we gotta put that scandal to bed. Uh, and it would be great if five or 10 years from now we looked back and said, this was the year we did it. And you can imagine some of the reasons why that might happen this year. <clears throat> so 
So several of you have heard Brian talk about calendars. We, we want to let you know that on your way out, you will be able to receive a calendar. There's also other literature from the Equal Justice Initiative, I think, about the museum and yeah. the lynching project. So you can read more about that. Um, so just to close us, I'm going to ask Tim Keller to pray for Brian, for the Equal Justice Initiative, for those who are incarcerated, and for us, that we would be motivated to be part of bringing justice to these issues. Our Father, thank you so much for, uh, for Brian and his work. I thank you for the encouragement he is. I thank you for the... Um, I thank you for the uh, loving rebukes that he has um, laid upon us, but we do know that um, that uh, the, uh, the, the rebukes of a, of a friend is, is, a, is an act of love. And I think many of us do feel lovingly counseled, lovingly uh, challenged tonight. I pray, Lord, that uh, as so often those of us with power in the culture often do, we would not just wring our hands and say, yeah, we got to do better at that, and then go off being so busy making our money and doing our things that we don't make any changes. I pray that would not be the case. I, it would glorify you if it was not the case. So truly lead us to repentance and the joy and the grace that comes from that. And we pray uh, all these things through Jesus. In his name we pray it. Amen. Amen. So would you join me in thanking Brian and Tim?